Radio across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Coming next. We're going to talk with a man who lives in a log cabin in South Africa. Gareth Patterson is his name. We're going to talk about the secrets of lions and elephants and Africa's version of the elusive Bigfoot. That's in the Midnight Hour. Stay here. Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Across the UK. Online. On DAB. And on your smart speaker. The Unexplained. With Howard Hughes. On Talk Radio. Sunday night, it's Monday morning. It is, what is it now, the 10th of August 2020, and we can once again between us ask the question, what exactly happened to this year? And who ran away with it? I don't know. (laughs) We can just hope for better things in 2021, really. Uh, At least we've all learned new skills, or many of us have learned new skills in these weird times. Thank you very much uh, to Simon in Aberdeen. Simon, thank you for the report from Aberdeen, and I hope that you are okay and the people of Aberdeen, um, you know, are going to be okay through the latest restrictions. Uh, Marcus, also nice to hear from you in Coimbra. I don't know whether I pronounced that properly. That was probably a little too Spanish, which is in Portugal. Nice to get uh, your thoughts as well and thank you if you sent an email to me at the unexplained at my website theunexplained.tv i get to see every email that comes in and they are all every single one read through and gratefully received and if there's something you want then i will get right back to you and if i haven't got back to you yet <laughs> then please remind me life has been a little weird and a little strange and hectic um, my podcast by the way is in that same location theunexplained.tv but back to the radio as they say and after midnight we like to go into things in a little greater depth we have more time to expand maybe than we do certainly during the first news hour where it's you know coming at you all the time and fairly full on i'm going to talk to a man recommended to me by the big cat man rick minter gareth patterson uh, he's british but he went to south africa quite young loved it and stayed there for reasons that i fully totally understand because of my experience of that amazing world in one country wildlife is his thing cryptozoology it certainly fronts on cryptozoology it borders on cryptozoology we're going to talk about some fascinating things but let's get to uh, south africa right now and gareth should be hearing us at this moment gareth thank you very much for coming on my show thank you very much howard talk to me first would you about your location because you have a very different location well, where I stay at the moment, where I've, where I've stayed for quite a few years now, is right on the edge of the uh, Nisna Forest, which is uh, about six hours up the coast from Cape Town. I live in a, a, a little tiny wooden cabin on the edge of the forest. Um, literally a stone's throw from me is about 600 square kilometers of Afro-maintained montane uh, forest, and that's all part of uh, a, a national park here. I think it's the third or fourth biggest, uh, largest national park in South Africa, which is the Garden Route National Park. And it's um, in the in the forest and the surrounds there that uh, I did a lot of work and uh, rediscovering the world's most southerly elephants, if you want to call them that, the famous Neisner elephants, which were thought to be extinct back in 1999, or they thought there was only one left, a functionally extinct population as they described it at the time. And thankfully, uh, that's not the case today. Mm. And we have to explain to people, maybe some people hearing this have been to Cape Town, been to the Cape. They've done the wine lands and all the rest of it. But when you go to Cape Town, you do the wine lands, maybe you see a little bit of the coast. You don't actually go inland, not very much. And that's a pity because once you start going up from Table Mountain and further up, up, up from there, the landscape changes dramatically, doesn't it? It does. I mean, if you're following from Cape Town, running up the East Coast, this is where um, Nice is actually very, very different to large parts of South Africa. I mean, South Africa is generally a very arid country, and yet we've got this huge chunk, like I said, about 600 square kilometers, uh, of, which you can really regard as rainforest, uh, which is a remnant sort of rain, rainforest system, which used to exist in, you know, in, back in millennia, which used to exist from, from here right the way up the, up, the, um, up, the east co- up the East Coast, the Rift Valley, 
to Central Africa and East Africa and through climate change and all the rest of it, it's shrunk and shrunk and shrunk until you've got this little tiny island of, um, of this almost um, impenetrable rainforest. Um, and it's only about seven kilometers inland from, from the little uh, tourist town of Neisner. Mm. And if there are mysterious creatures to be found, if there are wild creatures to be found, then you will find them in that forest aplenty, won't you? It is, it is a mysterious place. And I think, you know, it's, it's largely unexplored. I mean, the first settlers really came here about, I don't know, in the late 1780s or whatever. Um, it's, it was a difficult place to get to in those days um, when they were coming by ox wagon or stage, stages or whatever, coming from Cape Town. They, uh, before they got to Neisner, they're coming along the coast, they'd actually detour inland to the arid Karoo and then around this portion of the country because you've got such incredibly deep ravines and, and gorges here that they couldn't get across. So it, it was really a bit of a, a lost world, a little lost world. And I think that's why the elephants managed to hang in here for so long. Uh, if you consider when the settlers first came to South Africa, um, it was estimated uh, a number of years ago, computer modeling, that South Africa probably had a population then of about 100,000 elephants. And within 200 years, because of ivory, hunting and sport hunting and um, just the encroaching um, people and all the rest of it, that population within 200 years went down to about only 200 elephants, of which the Neisner elephants was probably the last little, you know, large, largest group that was left. I mean, it's un unbelievable figures. I mean, in the southern Cape where I was, where I am rather, there was, um, it was thought to be about 10,000 elephants. And today, if we've got 12 left, that's a lot, but it's actually a miracle that they're still here, considering that in you know the majority of the country they were completely wiped out. What was that number again? Um, historically, in South Africa, there would have been about a hundred thousand. No, I got that. I got that one. What about now? And uh, well, today, where, where there was once about ten thousand um, elephants, we've probably got, with my estimations, um, probably only about twelve or so left. A dozen. Yeah. And that is largely because of the actions of man. That is, yeah. And so, it, so it's a double-edged sword in the sense that it is literally a miracle that there's any elephants left at all. I mean, when you consider elephants were existing, you know, right down in Cape Town, the West Coast, right the way through most of South Africa um, on the arrival of the white man in those few hundred years, uh, they were wiped out to the... Ex I mean, there were no elephants, for example, what is in... Uh, today's Kruger National Park, which I think today, I think it's about 10,000 elephants or some, somewhere around there. Um, back, back in the day, back in those days, a few hundred years ago, there were no elephants in what is today the Kruger National Park. The Kruger National Park elephant population is actually made up of refugee um, elephants coming across from present-day Mozambique and recolonizing in the Kruger National Park because historically they were wiped out of that part of what they used to call the old Transvaal. You know, I, I'm really embarrassed, actually, that I didn't realize that the figures were, were as you put them. I don't know where I've been, and I've, you know, I've been to South Africa many times. But, you know, you go and do the tourist things. Like, I remember in my first encounter, which was 1994, long time ago, and I'd been doing some training for the SABC there, like the South African equivalent of the BBC. And I went yeah. for two weeks. I, I did a week of training with them, and then they said, you can have a week to go and do whatever you want. And I think for a while they lent me a car. It was, you know, these were different days. And I went to a game reserve or a nature park called Shishlui, very much for the tourists, uh, which is up near Richards Bay, north of Durban. You're going north, north there. Um, that's uh, kind of near the border with Mozambique, isn't it? Yes, it is, yeah. 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 Uh, but, you know, I, I saw elephants there. In fact, the little little hire car that I'd got uh, was uh, was pretty much chased by, by elephants. And I just thought, well, this is Africa, plenty of elephants um, in Africa. And I thought no more about it. I thought they were rather lovely. I was glad that I was able to put the car in reverse and get out of there before being chased out by them. But yeah. I really thought that elephants were plentiful. No, I mean, that's the whole thing. Um Generally, across the board, mammal, mammal populations, certainly large mammal populations, I mean, were pretty much wiped out of, wiped out of South Africa. 
Um, and um, yeah, I mean, lion populations, I mean, I mean, probably another thing that you might not be aware of, because uh, a lot of people are not aware of the fact I come from a lion background. Um, and for, the, for the majority of my adult life, I've been, it's been lions and elephants. Mm. Um, but I, I first started studying um, lions back in 1983. I think it was a population in Botswana. And, um, and I wrote a book about my research on that population there. It sort of gave me an indication of what's happening, happening continent wide in, 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 in Africa then. Uh, we had a population in that portion of Botswana of about 60 lions that I knew of. And within three and a half years, they had been reduced by about half down to about 30 by trophy hunting, by snaring, poaching, poisoning. And this sort of gave me an indication, sadly, that this was what was being duplicated throughout Africa. Now, when I first started studying lions back then in the early 80s, it was estimated more of a sort of thumb suck estimate um, that there was probably about 250,000 lions throughout Africa. And today, we are now realizing that we've probably only got between 15 and 20,000 in the entire continent of Africa. And uh, so, I mean, within my working life, um, we've seen a reduction of over 90% of the African lion, which is, the lion is, in many respects, its own worst enemy, because it's such a visual um, lion, um, visual animal. Everyone knows what the lion is. We think of the king of beasts, um, but not m many people, uh, you know, realize that um, it's actually a very endangered species. Some sort of analogy there. You can imagine a stadium. Well, I mean, post you know pre-COVID times and all the rest of it of you know capacity of a hundred thousand people in a stadium, and it's only got fifteen to twenty thousand um, people in, and every person represents a lion. Uh, that really sums up, you know, what the situation of of the lion is in, in Africa today. Okay, we need to pause it there. Just one quick thing before we have to get to commercials here, uh, which is, um, you know, one of the the constants in in broadcasting. Um, you mentioned the hunting of, the poaching of, the the game trade in South Africa. Um, now, look, yeah. there's a lot of money involved in this, and there are a lot of interests involved in this. And that involves a certain amount of risk, doesn't it? I mean, you've just alluded to that. Have you been at risk because of the uh, the, the conservationist stand that you've taken? Well, I was in the late 1990s. I was the first person really independently who went out there to expose this 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 real shame of South Africa, which is the, the what what is called the canned lion industry, a sordid industry in South Africa, whereupon lions are are bred in captivity. Um, there's three stages of it: they're, they're bred in captivity, the cubs taken away from the mother, then they're used for for volunteer work. Volunteers na naively, naively think they rearing really, these cubs are going to be returned to the wild. Then they're used for tourism, walking with lion. Mm. The trips and that sort of stuff and then ultimately they end up in the trophy and hunting industry breeding industry and they're shot by overseas um, trophy hunters and App appalling uh, that that still goes on we've seen this in our newspapers here and it always it, it always uh, brings out horror in people in this country who simply don't understand that these things still go on and when i first exposed it i mean there was about two, three hundred lions caught up in this whole system here in South Africa. Today, we estimate there's between six and eight thousand lions caught up in this sordid industry. We've only got two and a half thousand lions in, in the true wilds here. We've got eight, eight to twelve thousand, I think it is, um, in captivity. And so it's just escalated and mushroomed. Yes, and as a result of exposing that, the independent work. And then I worked with the International Fund for Animal Welfare, who collaborated, collaborated with the Cook Report from the UK. Yes, I remember did that. The, mm. Did the expose on that whole thing, and yeah, as yeah, as a as a result of that, um, I, I received my first lot of um, yeah for two consecutive years. I got death threats because of exposing canned lion hunting, and then I got the next year death threats again for exposing. Uh, the capture of 30 baby elephants from where I lived in Botswana, um, which were which were um, sold to a trader in South Africa 
who was brutalizing them, actually, for breaking their spirit for resale into the wildlife trade. Well, and Gareth, it's, it's tragic. It's frightening. It's awful. And I realize yeah. now, I think probably one of the reasons why you live in such a remote location, perhaps, is uh, is for your own safety to an extent. But listen, no, which, it's not a problem. It's no, not no. a problem now. I mean, this was like 20 years ago. So it's things are better. Problem. Yeah. Good. Okay, we'll continue. We, I want to talk about uh, mysteries of the animal kingdom, but I think we had to explain all of those things to set the backdrop for where we're about to go. So I want to do it in this order. Uh, lions we'll be talking about. We'll also talk about the elephants and also about Africa's version of Bigfoot. Uh, that's pretty new to me, but we'll talk about that and much more with Gareth Patterson coming next here on The Unexplained at Talk Radio. Stay here. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Talk Radio. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. time this is talk radio to the unexplained with howard hughes animal mysteries in africa i guess would be a broad brush way of describing this hour but it's much more than that and it also will involve discussion of a kind of bigfoot uh which gareth patterson has been on the trail of but gareth patterson's done an awful lot of work as you heard with the elephants and the lions now gareth i'm fascinated by the lions because of course every time you go there yeah, there is a great enticement to go and see a lion park uh, of various mm. sorts and i got to know uh, kevin richardson who you might know who worked with the lions uh, a lot at his lion park uh, in Khateng near johannesburg um yes. you know and i i love the lions i know that your experience is with lions in the wild but there's a lot that is misunderstood about the lions isn't it about their about their communities the way that they behave most of us think lions in the wild very dangerous if they bite you they'll kill you and that's all there is to them they're killing machines and of course <laughs> their lives are much more complex than that they are they're, they're, they're social animals like us um, and you know in terms of their reaction to people uh, for very good reason they're actually far more fearful of us than what than what we are of them and that's because you know they know let, let me put it this way it's a, it's a it's a very um misleading impression you get when you're a visitor to south africa and you're sitting in a game drive vehicle and um lions wild lions walk past the vehicle or whatever the situation is there is that they have become habituated they they know jolly well that those are human beings sitting in a vehicle they do know that um but if you step out of the vehicle if you're walking in the bush and you can come across those same lions nine out of ten times they will run away they have an instinctive instinctive fear of the upright figure of a man that mm -hmm. that, that just sends absolute danger signals isn't that it but we have to say please don't try that because as you know the south african newspapers once a year or so carry the story of somebody who rolls down a window or they think i can just step out here because they look so lazy and it, you find out they're not lazy yeah exactly it's a completely different animal if anything like that happened if you're on a wilderness trail in some of the wilderness areas here and you and you accidentally walk into a pride of lions there's a there's a hell of a commotion uh, there'd be mock charging and and then they'd probably move off and and yet you might be in a vehicle a couple of hours later you might come across the same pride and they're, and they're quite relaxed because they're they're, they're they're habituated to people in the vehicles but uh, very fearful of people on foot mm. you know um, I, I can remember having the car pound well a number of times actually having a higher car or whatever car i was in pounced on yeah. by young lions and the first right. time i was scared anybody who doesn't come from you know an african background probably would be scared because you don't know what they're going to do and it was explained mm. to me later you know chill out relax they're playing yeah, I mean, that would, that would be unusual to happen in the true wild situation. That might happen in a lion park situation, um, but that's unusual to happen in a, in, a, in a proper wild area. Now, the true unexplained part of this and the interesting part of this is, is the lion behavior. Uh, 
and the fact that some people and they've got themselves into the newspapers and they become quite well known um have actually lived with the lions i don't know whether you could be classified as one of those people i know that you've lived around the lions but there are people today who publish videos and things and they live among the lions and i, I think you know a lot of people hearing this now will be surprised to hear that but there are some people there aren't very many of them um how are they able to do that because our knowledge going to school and learning about things on television is that you know you you don't mess with them but there are people who actually become part of the pride uh, how is that part what do they do how do they key into the the world of the lions there's actually very few of us who have actually truly lived with lions in the wild there was george adamson who i mentioned earlier and his assistant at the time tony pitts john and then there was myself and that's really it largely as far as truly living with with wild lions in the wild um people who are um living amongst hand reared lions and it, it sort of gives the impression that they might be living with wild lions but these are lions that grew up with people mm -hmm. and are are habituated so it's a very different kind of lion so, so um, you literally I, let's get this clear you literally lived among wild lions and you got to know their ways and you you were able to do that safely yes when i when i rescued george adamson's last lions i moved them to an area in botswana where i was studying lions and um i basically had, had to act as as mother and father of those of those three lions and lions in the wild have a very long childhood um before they become really prolific at hunting and and fending for themselves and it's not just that because they've got to establish themselves territorially um so i chose the area very very carefully i did not start the rehabilitation of the lions in an area where there was a resident pride that's very very important because otherwise your lions would just be killed and i literally lived as as a as a human member of the pride so every single day for 8 hours a day every day i was out in the wilds with the lions exploring the area hunting with them uh, i can tell you many stories they once saved my life from a from a leopard that they had attacked when the females um um were pregnant and eventually had cubs of their own they led me to their newborn cubs i mean it's just unheard of for a human being to be led you know by a wild lioness i mean they they became truly wild lions um in every single sense of sense of the way i mean they'd run away from people on foot and yet they had this incredible bond with me um and, and how uh, were you able to communicate with them you know the, the the people that i've seen doing this and the only people i've seen doing this are people as you rightly say are among lions who've been bred in captivity so they're used to people but you were with lions that were not initially used to people it's almost as if they are tapping into your your thoughts i know they're not but they they're certainly tapping into your behavior well they are tapping into my thoughts as well i remember on a number of occasions um on about three four occasions i had to do book launches in the uk while i was rehabilitating the lions well actually at that stage they were completely rehabilitated back into the wild and they would just periodically bid, visit me at my at my camp uh, or i would find them out in the wilds when i was doing anti poaching work or whatever um but um while i was in the uk on those three occasions they wouldn't go anywhere near the camp and yet when i returned to the camp and not just because they can hear my vehicle because that same vehicle was in and out of my camp during the, my absence but on my return on the, each three occasions they would be literally waiting for me so there is that there is that communication at work but also it, i had a background in lion behavior because i was studying them um studying wild lions that's what gave me the the experience if anything or the background or the cornerstone or whatever to be able to rehabilitate lions because like i said only George Adamson, Tony Pitts, John and myself have truly done this work in that particular method which is living with them and being part of literally part of the pride. Um so knowing the behavior of lions was was essential to that project. But, and, but uh, how is it that they were able to know that you were absent? If this is almost like you know when I was a teenager I had a dog who knew when I was coming home from school but I mean this is of a completely different magnitude. No, it's 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 exactly the same thing. I was first introduced 
to it when when I was um, living, working with George Adams in, in Kenya, and he had a wild pride of lions. These are second and third generation descendants of the lions that he re rehabilitated back into the wild. These are lions that have never been handled by people, like I say, second and third generation wild born. And um, Yorkshire TV at the time were making a documentary on George, the last documentary on his life. Um, Lord of the Lions, Adamson of Africa, and George was flown out of where we were to various places where he or his adventures took place in Kenya. And uh, on the couple of occasions that he flew out, this wild pride was, 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 um, the wild pride would actually, is actually the opposite in the sense that um, one, one hint of the uh, film crew, when they were filming, that the lions didn't want anything to do with the camp and they wouldn't visit George. And I spent all my time tracking these lions. Um, but, um, and during his absence, they wouldn't be there either. But on when he would get back, and for example, he went off for an eye operation to Aus Austria once, and, and the lions didn't go anywhere near the camp. And on his arrival, the, the lions were there. On a more sort of somber note, I, I think it was the night before he was murdered, uh, this wild pride actually came to his camp and, and he walked amongst them. The following day he was murdered. In the days that followed his funeral, he was buried near his camp. And um, the funeral, there were, you know, it's like several hundred people from all over the world, dignitaries, celebrities were there at George's funeral. And when things calmed down and the helicopters had left and all the rest of it, an old friend of George was looking after the camp and looking after the lines that I inherited. Um, the wild pride actually went down to George's grave. And um, this, this man, Douglas Hamilton, um, Dougie Collins, sorry, he went down to the to the grave, um, a can of stones, the next morning, and there was the, the 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 imprints, and you could see where the lions had actually laid down next to um, George's grave. It went even beyond that with my own male lion, who was lured out of Botswana. Um, similar situation, you know, this was 25, 26 years ago. Very similar situation to Cecil the lion, a number of lions, a number of years ago. My lion, Batian, was lured out of a protected area by a trophy hunter, by a professional hunter, shot by an American client. Same story, used a bait, all that sort of thing. Eventually, when I got Batian's remains back, my lion's remains back, and I buried him at a place um, close to my camp, um, all sorts of things happened. His sisters had cubs at the time, and his one sister, Rafiki, um, I didn't know this until the following morning. I went down to Batian's grave, and then I just saw around his grave there was these tiny pug marks of little tiny cubs. And the first th thing that this was the first time at about six weeks old, mothers take them out of the nursery site. And Rafiki had the night before taken her her her, her offspring, her cubs out of the nursery site, and amazingly took him took them straight down to where Batian was buried. And there I was standing there with these little pug marks around his grave. Just to round off this segment then about the lions, when you are up close and personal with the lions, when you are part of the pride, when they understand and respect you, and because they, they seem to be perceiving things in non-verbal ways, <laughs> let's put it that way, you know, reading your thoughts, yeah. reading your actions, whatever, do you have to be careful about what you think? You know, you're so set in that you're so set in that lion world, that lion moment, and hours and hours and hours of it. You know, I'm spending more time with the lions than what I was with my own kind. <clears throat> so I was in the lion's world, and and so yes, I, I firmly believe that whether it's hunting strategies or whatever, telepathy is at, at work. They are communicating over distances through not only through calling. And communication, but also telepathy again. Um, I'll give you an amusing uh, uh, situation once where um, I was obviously wasn't picking up what they had in mind. So they were wild lions and they were doing their thing and we came across a huge, huge herd of eland, which are the largest antelope in the world. Uh, yes, in the world. And big bull elands are about, um, about six foot, almost six foot at the shoulder and weigh over a ton. 
and we came across a, a massive herd, 250 of them, and the lions saw these eland and they got into their very elaborate pincer movements um, of, of who's going to go where to encircle them and all the rest of it. And it does seem with lions, it's almost like a pre-organized thing. Who is actually going to make the kill? I mean, their elaborate pincer movements are quite extraordinary. So they went off, and I just stayed behind on that occasion. I just stood there to see what was happening, and they disappeared. And then a few minutes later, I just had this dust storm in front of me, heading towards me, and it was like a scene out of the Wild West. And before I knew it, there was this massive herd of, of eland just pouring towards me. And we always say in the bush, there's never a good tree when you need one. And all <laughs> I had nearby was this small mapani tree, which was probably only about six inches wide and about eight foot tall. And I just stood behind that and th these elands just, eland just crashed past me. I could almost touch them and they thundered by. And then when, when the dust settled and everything calmed down a bit, apart from my heartbeat, and then suddenly I heard, ooh, ooh, and, the, and it was the lions and they were coming to me and they looked at me and they're very expressive animals facially. And then they looked all around them and then back at me to say, as if to say, well, where is it? You know, where's the kill? It was your turn to do it this time. Oh, my so, God. I hope you could. Well, yeah. you'd obviously got away with that one. That's why we're speaking now. Gareth I Patterson did. talking with us uh, from a real log cabin on the fringes of a real forest near the Cape in South Africa. Uh, not the tourist areas that you've seen, but a place of beauty and wildness, a place called Neisner, very close to a place called Neisner. We're going to talk, having talked about the lions and their mysteries, we're going to talk about the elephants and also that area's version maybe of Bigfoot with Gareth Patterson coming next here. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Gareth Patterson, a man who not only lives among the wildlife, but is very much a part of the wildlife of Southern Africa. And many things that you won't have heard, and many things that don't get reported in the newspapers, I think we're talking about now. We talked about the lions, and how they have a kind of ESP, or something, <laughs> so that they can know what you're thinking, and perhaps anticipate your behavior, and perhaps uh, predict that you're the one who's supposed to be doing the kill now, so why didn't you do the kill? <laughs> All of those things. Uh, fascinating stories. Let's talk about the elephants then, Gareth, and again, similar to the lions, there are far fewer of them than there used to be, and I didn't know that and I wasn't aware of that. Um, what about the mysteries of the, the elephant, if we can call it, kingdom that you've discovered? Things that we wouldn't know. Well, you know, I think going back to, again, the historical side, putting that into some sort of perspective, uh, I think when, when I was born, it was estimated that there was about 1.2 million of, of uh, elephants in Africa. And the recent continental census a couple of years ago came up with a figure of about 300 i think 345,000. so that puts it in perspective once again on you know on on the massive decline of these of these animals um but living amongst them you know the, you know the, the lion has been a large part of my life but the elephant have always been there um i've always been fighting for the elephants <clears throat> as well and um i can only describe them as having you know almost uniquely human qualities um they they they, they literally cry salt tears um they will cover their dead um they will almost bury their dead um, there's been we <coughs> it's been it's been it's been recorded historically it's been recorded in modern times scientists know about this we can't explain it why they do this um, it's, um, but they, 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 they seem to have a, a very real sense of death and what death is all about. And, and very strangely, they, 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 they cover and bury their kind, but they do that to one other kind, very strangely, and that is humankind. And the very first dead human I ever saw was someone who was killed by an elephant in Botswana. And cutting a long story short, I, I was alerted to this man had walked into a herd of elephants at night, and I went out to to try and find him. And I found him with my tracker, and uh, yes, and his body was was um, partially covered. They will cover 
um, people that they come across who, who have been who, who have died in the wild or they have killed out of retaliation or whatever. Um, so they're, they're almost like unique in in that sense. Um, so very humane humane animals. We can relate to them. They've got a similar sort of life lifespan as us and. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're incredible animals. And, you know, when you consider that they are, in terms of behavior, the most studied mammal on Earth, and we've only been studying them for less than, than what I've been alive on Earth. I'm 57 next month. Um, it's incredible what we've learned about them, that they're communicating with infrasound, this low-frequency sound that travels over tens of kilometers at a frequency that we can't hear. This whole thing about them, you know, having, um, mourning the death of their, 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 their dead ones and all this sort of thing. They, they really, there's a lot to learn from elephants. Well, that long-distance communication is, you know, amounts. at the risk of making a crass joke, it's almost, uh, it, it is literally a trunk call, isn't it? Why would they want to make communication over such distances? I think because they, you know, they, you'd have breakaway groups of elephants from the main herd. They're keeping in contact. And when those groups do get together, you think that it's almost like a battleground. But it's actually such excitement when two subgroups of a herd get together. They are so delighted to be amongst one another. And so they're communicating over large distances. And like I say, it's, it's almost like um, someone described it as silent thunder. And I think that's a very <laughs> good way of describing it. And if something bad is happening to one group of elephants... Uh, is that group of elephants then able to alert another group of elephants, perhaps adjacent, separated by 10 kilometers or so? Ex that's an excellent point, because back in the day, fortunately, no culling of elephants takes place anymore in the Kruger National Park here in South Africa, not, in, not since, I think, 1994. But for about 30 years um, prior to that, every year, about 500 elephants, the management's idea at the time was that you've got to regulate their numbers. And today we realize that they actually regulate their own numbers by themselves. So for 30 years, we were just inflicting enormous trauma upon elephants in South Africa in Kruger National Park by slaughtering um, elephants, whole entire family herds. And then even worse than that, capturing their babies and then selling them to zoos. Hundreds of these babies went worldwide uh, to zoos and, and walking with elephant safaris and all this sort of stuff. And what you're talking about now, yes, exactly. So one traumatized um, herd of elephant, that trauma could be, hear, be heard um, you know, tens of, of kilometers away by other elephants. And, and so it's almost like a domino effect. So you traumatize one herd and it, it reverberates through the whole population. They can all feel the, sh the, the trauma of the elephants that have been slaughtered. And do they cooperate? If one bunch of elephants is under threat, does another group of elephants go to their assistance, or do they simply react accordingly and make themselves scarce? They make themselves scarce, but very interestingly, what I've seen here in Neisner um, and in other parts of Africa is that when terrible things have happened there, they, they tend to leave those areas and don't revisit them. Here in Neisner, where elephants have been were wiped out in the past, it's only in the time that I've been here in the last 20 years that I'm finding that these elephants here, these few remaining elephants, are actually recolonizing and going back to areas where um, their ancestors used to live. It takes generations, literally. Um, before they will go back to a place of trauma. How astonishing. And yeah. it was while you were living with and investigating the elephants that you came across, I believe, this uh, phenomenon that I'd never heard of, the, the South African Bigfoot or Otang, that doesn't quite look like Bigfoot or Sasquatch. It's rather different, but it's very much ingrained in, in the culture, in the folklore. Yes, I, I mean, I came down here in 1999, and I was actually... To a, to a town quite near here called George, and I was setting up a, a natural habitat habitat sanctuary that for four lions that we had saved from saved from that canned lion industry, and uh, setting up this huge sanctuary for them. and And this town is about fifty kilometers away from Neisner, and I came to Neisner. I've never been to the forest before, and um, and I'd always been intrigued by these miraculous elephants that are still existing here on the tip of Africa. 
And I decided with my girlfriend at the time, Francia, that we, we should take the opportunity to go into the forest. And we were staying at a hotel, <clears throat> staying at a hotel in Neisner. And, um, and uh, we got to know the manager and uh, he gave us um, instructions on how to, how to get into, how to get into the forest um, the following morning. And, um, and he's, and, and, and he said to me, you know, Gareth, when you're done exposing this whole canned lion thing, why don't you come to there and learn more about these elephants? Because the authorities say there's only one left, but us locals believe that there's a few more. And, uh, he says, but actually there's something even more mysterious. And I asked him what it was. And he says, well, I had a group of German tourists here a few months ago and they did the same as you they asked for directions into the forest i gave them directions and then that afternoon i saw them again when they had returned and they were very shaken up people they were in the bar and they were silent and i went up to them and said to them you know is, is something wrong and they said yes there is and uh, they explained to him how they were driving on the fringe of the forest and these three human human-like figures at first they thought they were humans but they were covered in hair in the russet brown hair ran across the road in front of them now the hotel manager's response to that was of course he said no i mean obviously you saw baboons and they turned around to him and actually they got quite angry with him and he they said to him listen we are well-traveled well-educated people um, and we certainly know what baboons were in fact when we left into the as we went into the forest we saw a troop of baboons and what we saw later on was certainly not baboons and they duly then actually they were in such shock that they actually uh, checked out of the hotel and left and they were in a total shock so that was my first introduction to it i mean when he told me the story i thought to myself yes there must be in baboons because baboons do stand upright to look over distances and all the rest of it. I had no idea of what else it could be. But your maximum height for a baboon is what, three and a half, four feet, you know, yeah. one, one, one meter, that's about it. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, you know, I didn't know what was going on and I didn't, I didn't dwell on it. I mean, so two years later when I came down to formally look into the elephants and to find out and to study them, actually the last thing on my mind was this story about these German tourists coming across these, these relic hominoids in, in, in the forest. But these stories started drifting towards me. And then I was discussing, dis, um, discussing um, food plant samples with a forestry department scientist, went out of the blue in his office. He turned around to me and says, Gareth, you're, doing, you're walking hundreds of kilometers in the forest and everything. Have you ever come across in your research of the elephant, have you ever come across a strange, upright, human-like figure, creature, being out there? And I said to him, no. Um, I said to him, why do you ask? And he says, well, just over the last two months, we've had two separate reports from our forestry workers in two separate areas, and they swear blind that they've seen such a being. And, and then, obviously, the, the, the story of the tourists came flooding back into mind, but the, the, that went again. And then another story came to me. And then months later, I, I became friends with um, a, a wonderful old lady called Mrs. Jordan. She is probably the last, she was probably the last generation of, 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 the, of the original first people of this land, which is the, the Bushmen, the sand people. She died a few years ago, and um, I would stop at her little place on the edge of the forest. They were forest people. She lived there with her, 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 her daughters and the family, and I got to know her, and she would tell me about the elephants, and she spent over 60 years living in, in, in the environment of the forest, in the edge of the forest, and then out of the blue, she started to, telling me about this, this being called the Otum. And that's where I actually got a name to it. You know, I'd heard about it, but it didn't have a name. And she, she described to me her own sighting, um, which, which was amazing. She, she heard something at night in her little house, and uh, it must have been summertime because the window was open. She was doing knitting by a paraffin lamp. She had a little dog next to her. The dog started barking. She, she got a little torch out, she shone out the window, couldn't see anything, went back to her knitting, and then 
Then the dog started barking again. She shone again. And she knew, though she hadn't seen the Otungs before, they, the forest people, they know about them. They, they are no more mysterious to them than the elephants, for example. They, they are flesh and blood. This is not a, a, a ghost or a spirit-like being. They, they recognize them as being flesh and blood. And yet they so have she, mystical qualities in many parts of the world. And yes, I'm, I'm not too... I, I, yes, I, I hear about the mystical qualities in other parts of the world. Here they seem very uh, flesh and blood. And anyway, she, she picked up her torch again, and she shone out. And then, lo and behold, she had a little vegetable garden not far away. And there was an Otung standing there, this human-like figure. <laughs> and she saw it, and she was shocked. I mean, even though she knew of the existence, she'd seen the footprints of these beings before she looked at it and it's quite interesting you know it's in the detail of the eyewitnesses that i find so fascinating because she said as she was shining the torch she said this being was trying to look around the beam to see her if you know what i mean so she was keeping the beam on it and he was trying to look around to one side to the other to try and look at her and then it turned to one side and then it just vanished. I mean, these, these beings are so incredibly fast and it took off and she went back and she was really shocked and she sat down and then about five minutes later, she heard a rumble of a truck coming past her place. And obviously this being heard the truck a long time before she did. And that's why perhaps it, it disappeared. And, um, and then came the fateful day. I was, I was doing research. I think it was August 2002, a very clear Sunday morning. I'd just come back from a place I call the secret place of the elephants. I discovered where these Meisner elephants will routinely go to a spring in a very remote area to drink this. They're, they're connoisseurs of water. This is such brilliant water. They will keep on going to this one particular spot. And I was returning to my vehicle at quite a distance. I was on foot. Last thing on my mind, you know, would be upright human-like beings. And I was focused on the elephants. I was enjoying the day. I'd done my work for the day. I was heading back to the vehicle. And I just had... Because of my, 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 my bush awareness, you, I, I, you don't need bush awareness. You can be in a restaurant and someone could be staring at you and you just feel that stare and you can turn around and you can see that person looking at you. So it's, not even, it's just an instinctual thing. So I, I just felt I was being watched and I turned around and there was a strand. There's a lot of plantations here as well. There's a strand of, stand of um, pine trees to my left about 30, 40 meters away or a little bit more. And I just saw this small upright figure, I say small, um, over five foot, I'd say about five, three, five, four foot, five, yeah, five foot, three inches, somewhere around there. And it was just peering out of the, out behind this one tree. It was rustic in color. My bush instinct, when it comes to that situation, if that was a predator, for example, you don't turn around and stop and stare at it because that's interpreted as a threat and you might get charged or whatever. So my instinct was just to, I don't even have to think about it, it's unconscious. I, I saw what I saw and then I kept it in the corner of my eye for as long as I could, carried on walking, and then I walked for about, must have been close on half a kilometer or a kilometer. And then I turned around, saw nothing was there, obviously, and then I just sunk to the ground, completely in shock. And this shock, you know, whether it's, it's what I experienced or the German tourists or the many, many witnesses that I've spoken to over the years and, and recent. I mean, when my book about this came out, Beyond the Secret Elephants, earlier this year, people have been coming forward with their experiences of this, of these Otung. And this shock is very, very real. It's, it's, it's almost like a post-traumatic stress disorder. And I was, it hits you immediately with the immediate shock. And I felt as if I was just in a fog. I don't know for how long. I just sunk to the ground with my rucksack, my backpack. And then I just stood up when eventually this mist was rising of confusion. I carried on to the car. And, um, yeah, and, and I was in, in a very confused state for some time. My girlfriend at the time, when I was writing the book, I had to contact her to say, 
you know, what did I tell you after that first experience? Because I've had four, four, four sightings of them. I said, what did I say to you? And she said, you were very confused there. And for days, you were very, very confused until finally you accepted that you had seen something like a relic hominoid. A relic hominoid, and, something yeah. beyond time, beyond our conception of time. So exactly. what, what sort of research then is going to be done about this? I mean, sadly, we're coming to the end of this hour, but and we need to have I, another long conversation about this. But what yes, sorts of research I, are being done there? I'm, I'm continuing with the work. I mean, Beyond the Secret Elephants is the sequel of my book, uh, The Secret Elephants, which is largely about the d rediscovery of the Nisner elephants. And this is taking it... Um, to to the level of letting the world know that these these beings do exist here, and um, I'm going into the second stage of the research now, and I'm studying them just like any other species that I've studied, like the elephants, like the elephant, uh, like the elephants, and like the lions. You know, looking at just learning more about them. You know, what is their range? What do they eat? What is their behaviour? This kind of thing. And so that's, how that's, are they related to creatures that seem to be very similar to them in vastly different parts of the world? And that's why there's been so much interest since the book has come out from people in North America um, contacting me and I've been doing interviews there because there it's a very well-known, it's part of pop culture there. Here it's, it's part of, very much part of African culture, but of an African culture that has been suppressed for so long. So these stories have not been coming out of indigenous people in, 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 in South Africa for many, many years. And with me talking to um, people who are born and bred here, um, these are probably the first time that stories are coming out from the people of the land here for in South Africa. So That's it's for not sure. for lack of stories, it's just they're not getting told. Gareth, we're out of time, but if it's okay, okay. with you and if there's enough material, uh, I'd love to talk with you again in a couple of months and we'll expand on this if, if you're up for that, if that would be good. That would be tremendous. Thanks very much. And Gareth, if people want to read about you, you have a website. I have a website, it's just garethpatterson.com. They can find me on Facebook as well, and I've written what, about 12 books now, and they're all available on Amazon, those in print, and those not in print, they're available as e-books, Kindle. And as they say in South Africa, go well, Gareth, go well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gareth Patterson, in a wonderful part of South Africa with some amazing material. We'll talk with him again. You bet we will. Uh, thank you very much to uh, studio producer Dave, uh, to home producer Reese this week, and above all, thank you to you for being part of this. My name is Howard Hughes. This has been The Unexplained on the radio. Till next we meet in one week from now. My name is Howard Hughes. It's been The Unexplained, and please, whatever you do, stay safe, stay calm. Above all, please stay in touch. Paul Ross is coming next. Actually, here. Good night. Talk radio across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Talk Radio.